you all for coming today to hear me speak. And just so you get an idea, how many folks have read Born to Run in the audience? Okay, so a good, a good chunk of you. How many have read Eat and Run in my book? Okay, so several as well. Those of you who haven't, um, that's good because uh, I've got some stories and some information to tell, regardless of whether you're familiar with uh, my background. So I've been running ultra marathons, which means anything over the distance of a marathon. I run races as far as 50 miles, 100 miles, and even beyond 24-hour races where I've run 165 miles, so six and a half marathons in 24 hours. So those of you who are familiar with running like a half marathon or a 10K, or just know what you can run minute per mile pace, that's running basically a 40-minute pace per mile for six and a half marathons back to back to back. And that includes uh, bathroom breaks as well. The clock still keeps going. They don't stop when you go to the bathroom. So that's the sport that I do. I love to do races typically in the mountains. And the training for some of these races involves training sometimes up to 120 miles per week, um, doing crazy long 30, 40 mile training runs. So I put my body through a lot. So as far as fueling and looking at food as fuel, it's very important for me as an athlete to not just put in the miles, but also consider what I'm putting into my body and fueling it. Let's start off with some photos here. This is, uh, I grew up much like a lot of you, uh, maybe some of you have grown up in the city here in London, but I grew up out in the woods in northern Minnesota. Um, basically having gardens, uh, picking rocks, um, weeding gardens. Uh, I remember just hating that uh, time in the summer and the spring as a kid, uh, having to work in the garden all the time. Um, spent a lot of time in the kitchen with uh, my mother and my grandparents preparing food. My mother was actually a home ec teacher, and I don't even know if I uh, even teach home ec in schools these days in the UK. They do still? Okay. So, she, she taught home ec, and we were, at a young age, growing up in the kitchen, just having to, to cook, and of course, I loved making cookies and all the sweet stuff. But she had us in the kitchen as soon as we could uh, stir, basically, the cooking batter and such. Of course, I grew up hunting and fishing, and it's quite ironic that I stand here um, talking about veganism and a plant-based diet, because I grew up um, out in the backwoods. My, my grandparents and my aunts and uncles and my, my father basically taught me how to hunt and fish. These are some of the, uh, the corn stalks. I can't believe how big they are. <laughs> and this is uh, fresh organic food, not GMO. And this is my mother. I grew up with her having multiple sclerosis at a very young age. At basically age eight, I saw my mother uh, not be able to walk uh, without assistance and lose a lot of her physical abilities over the years. And it really struck a chord with me um, when I was in my college years, eating a lot of fast food and just uh, eating you know, everything from two McChicken sandwiches and a large order of fries to uh, uh, Whoppers and all kinds of junk food in college because now I had a job and I could afford to, but I really kind of strayed away from, you know, basically that fresh food that we, we grew on, on, the, on our land and, and grew up eating all the time. And when I started working in hospitals and later seeing my mother's um, struggle with multiple sclerosis just deteriorate over the years, it really kind of hit me in that I needed to change the way that I was eating. Um, not because I wanted to run faster, but because I was looking at long-term health as my goal. Along the way, though, um, I was also training for ultra marathons, and at that same time, I was running crazy races such as the Western States 100. It's a race that you climb 23,000 feet. I'm sorry, you climb 18,000 feet, descend 23,000 feet um, over the Sierra Nevada mountain range, drop into the American River Canyon, and this is at 80 miles into that race. It's about the best time of the race because you cross the American River when it, it's 105 degrees Fahrenheit. You look forward to this moment, even though it's ice cold water. This is what it, sorry, we're getting a little glare from uh, the sun angle right now. It's a little harsh on the slides. This is what it looks like to finish in the daylight at Western States. Now, I finished in 2004 and set a new course record of 15 hours and 36 minutes. That's nine-minute nine pace, 22 seconds, for 100 miles. 
all sort of rocky, rugged terrain. And most people see the daylight the next day. So this is the first time I got on the track when it wasn't dark. And it was really an amazing experience. And to give you an idea, a lot of people run these races and typically, like the Western States, they give them 30 hours. Um, and in fact, I have a lot more respect for those individuals because they're out there almost twice as long as I am. that I've won twice was the Badwater 135. Who's, who's heard of the Badwater? Okay. It's 135 miles through Death Valley, the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, 246, 246 feet below sea level, climbs to the portal of Mount Whitney, which is over 8,000 feet. The race used to go to the top of Mount Whitney, which is the, the highest point in the lower 48 states of the U.S. And the whole idea was to go from the lowest point to the highest point. And nowadays they can't finish on the peak due to permit issues. But it is one of the most grueling races on the planet. The temperatures can exceed 125 degrees. And you're probably wondering why am I wearing all those clothes in that hot climate. But you literally have to shield yourself, much like in a cold environment when you put clothes on to hold heat in. Here you're trying to hold coolness in, the coolness of your body. So I'm wearing a, an ice hat, putting ice in the hat around the bandana, keeping the neck cool. And then, of course, wearing even pants because the radiant heat bouncing off the pavement just singes your legs almost. It, it feels like there's a blowtorch blowing on your legs the entire time. Um, those aren't puddles, by the way, on the pavement. That's uh, basically heat waves shimmering off the, the pavement. You can literally fry an egg on the pavement out there. And I'm, I'm dead serious. I've seen it firsthand. It's also a beautiful place. It looks like you're on the moon with mountains. There are 11,000 foot peaks towering over you the whole time. And then there's basically flat salts, uh, salt flats that are extending out into the horizon. Of course, a lot of you have read uh, Born to Run. You might be familiar with this picture. Um, it's Arnufo and I, one of the Taramaran runners, who uh, dueled it out down in the Copper Canyon. And I won't ruin the story for those of you who haven't read the book. But going down to the Copper Canyon was, even though it wasn't like one of my, my biggest races that I've done, it was probably one of the most special races because I got to run with these people who I've read about over years and have had a deep respect because they're a running tribe. They literally um, have running embedded in their culture from the races then, the competitions they have amongst their tribes. And sometimes these races they hold can last over a day, sometimes up to two days. And it's really like a festival and party. Um, they all get together and uh, the different uh, villages place bets. They literally bet their whole uh, goat herd um, on some of these races. And it's just, it's really quite the spectacle. And of course, instead of drinking after the race, most people uh, in Western the Western world, we like to have our party after the race. They have their party before the race and all during the race. So they, uh, they basically brew a whole batch of uh, corn brew and uh, basically celebrate before and during the event. Um, again, sorry for the, uh, the sun on the slides there. Go back. They're also known if you see the, the far left, you can't quite see it as well on the right side of the sun. But you can see their sandals, and a lot of you may be familiar with the Udarachis that they wear. And they're basically tire tread. Um, they find this material that a lot of people discard, old tires, and cut out sandals and then take a piece of uh, leather and rawhide and, and string that up. They're essentially their footwear, and that's all they wear. Um, it's pretty, pretty incredible. They cover distances of you know, 50 to 100 miles. Um, and they actually kind of get worn in when you see them up close. Some of them actually have their toes hanging off. And there's all kinds of different styles on how they wear those. But it became quite popular after Born to Run, of course, barefoot running, more minimal shoes. And it was a trend that was started um, in part due to this book and that tarn -tarn sandals. OK, another race. Um, who's familiar with the Spartathlon in the audience? Okay. It's a 153-mile race that goes from Sparta to Athens. It commemorates the route that Philippides ran. And this race basically is held every year. Um, and the Greeks aren't necessarily a running people. They're not known for their great endurance capabilities besides the great Giannis Kuros. But everybody comes out for this event. Um, you run through the villages. You have children following you on their bicycles. Um, the townspeople just get really wrapped up in this 
race, and it's it's a really a magical experience because the race commemorates, of course, Phidippides, the foot messenger, who gets credited a lot of times with uh, basically establishing the marathon distance. But he is most famous for running the distance from Athens to Sparta. He was basically getting a message from the Athenians to the Spartans saying, we need backup because they were being attacked by the Persians. Unfortunately, when he got to Sparta, the Spartans turned him down. He had to turn around and run another 153 miles back to Athens, deliver that message. Um, we only go one direction, um, so we don't cover 300 miles, but the race is just spectacular. Another race um, that I've got uh, a lot of uh, passion for is the Ultra Trail Tour de Mont Blanc, even though I've never won it. It's a fantastic race. It basically does a circle tour of Mont Blanc, basically traveling through Italy, Switzerland, and France, over 100 miles in length over almost 30,000 30, feet of climbing. And it's very similar to the Hard Rock, although the Hard Rock 100, which takes place in southern Colorado, it, uh, it covers over 33,000 feet of climbing and 33,000 feet of descent. Um, you climb a 14,000 foot peak. Six passes are over 13,200 feet. And it feels like you're breathing through a cocktail straw the whole time. So, um, Mont Blanc has almost as much climbing as Hard Rock, but does not have the altitude factor. So you, you're breathing a lot of thin air during that whole time. So in order to fuel myself for these races, um, some of you caught the presentation maybe yesterday. How many of you were here yesterday, by the way? Okay. So a handful of folks. Um, if there's time, I have a few slides that I did show yesterday talking about during training and during racing nutrition. But today I want to talk about how do I fuel my body to do these events and do that only on plant fuel. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I had to grow up, you know, working, you know, in the garden. It's very close to, you know, food. And of course I drifted away from that, like a lot of us, when we can start that buying our own food and, and eating the way that we want to. Uh, I had to start thinking differently though when I competed in ultras because I thought the best, not only the best way to eat long term for health, but I also had to think of how can I feel my body better on race day as well as getting ready for these races because each day that I would go out and train for three, four, five hours, I was breaking down my body and stressing it. In order for it to build back up, I needed to replace it with proper fuel. So. I like to use the analogy that our body is like a race car, and if we put low-grade fuel into it, you know, it'll, it'll keep us going. It'll keep the engine of a race car. You know, you can, you can drop regular, you know, diesel fuel into a race car, and it'll make it around the racetrack. But in terms of performance, and in terms of longevity of that engine, it's not going to perform well. So the same goes with our bodies. We need to think of our bodies as, you know, basically receptacles and fuel tanks that we need to put high-grade octane fuel, basically race, race car fuel into it. And one of the quotes I came across when I was learning about eating better and taking better care of my body, um, I remember once reading, you know, eating poorly will sustain life, but it won't sustain health. And I, it really resonated with me over the years. So, um, sure, you can eat junk food and you can eat white sugar, white flour, um, and it'll keep you living for a while, but it's not going to sustain health and avoid disease. So why high octane fuel? Um, I give a number of reasons. You know, most of us you know, who are here today, you're here because you're interested in health and wellness. Um, or maybe you just uh, came to hear about ultramarathons. But um, now that I've got you captive as audience, uh, you're, you're interested in health. Whether you're somebody who you know, runs, bikes, um, you know, does some form of exercise, or you're somebody who came here because you're interested in, in food and wellness and plant-based nutrition, um, you're interested and you're taking responsibility just by showing up today and showing an interest in things. So I think it's important that you look at taking responsibility because somebody isn't going to take care of your health for you. You've got to do that. Of course, another reason why you want to put high octane fuel is, in is longevity. Um, who wants to live longer in the audience? We all do, right? Or maybe there's two. But in general, all of us want to live longer, and if not what we do live longer, we want to be healthy, as healthy as possible. Um, I know a lot of runners, you know, 
they run because they want to stay in shape, they want to feel better. And those are all great reasons. So I think fueling the body better, yeah, one of the big reasons is really you know, making sure that we you know, live longer and have longevity. Um, of course, satisfaction of good health. Um, who's made a good meal here or you know, eaten good food and just felt better after? Or maybe you've gone for a run or a hike or exercise. We, we've all had that feeling where it's, it really feels good to cook a good meal and know that, okay, I'm you know, taking those steps and I'm putting effort into my, my wellness, my nutrition. Of course, the last one is knowledge. Um, you really, having the knowledge and having the wisdom of taking care of your body is huge. And a lot of you have passed that on to others, um, whether that's your children or whether that's family and friends. Um, I think it's, it's a powerful thing that knowing what is going into your body is going to help it perform better. And for me, as an athlete, knowing what goes into my body um, because I'm you know, preparing the food and taking responsibility, it's a huge advantage over somebody who just eats junk food and uh, just gets by. So I strongly encourage you to, to play an active role in your nutrition. Okay, much like there's a lot of blends of fuel that go into race cars as well as your, your everyday vehicles. There are a lot of different uh, blends in terms of uh, diets. And there's a lot of information out there. I mean, who doesn't get overwhelmed with all the, the new fads and the new diets that are coming out, whether it's paleo, whether it's the zone diet, um, whether it's the plant-based diet. There's just a lot of information out there. And, and people struggle with that. And I think the key thing to remember when you look at all of these diets that are coming out, um, unless it's just a full-on animal-based um, diet, for the most part, if you look at especially in paleo, they emphasize a lot of fruits and vegetables. And I think a common thread, no matter which diet it is, plant foods are a, a staple part of it. Now there's a lot of differing you know, viewpoints of how much fat, how much protein, how much carbohydrate, but in general, the goal is to start eating more healthy, whole foods. And those, of course, are less, you know, less altered, less packaged foods. Um, of course, whole grains and legumes are a staple of my diet. And I think if you look at across the board, the taramarans are a prime example. People look to them in terms of longevity and health. Um, you look at native peoples across the globe, and they typically, unless they're in the Arctic um, in the very uh, southern parts of the globe, you'll see that they incorporate a lot of whole grains and legumes. And this is something I think, you know, no matter if you eat 100% plant-based or you're somebody who's just starting to move towards a vegetarian diet, grains and legumes are not bad things, um, despite what you hear in some of the paleo uh, doctrine and other books out there. Of course, you look at the healthiest cultures around the world, they incorporate more plant foods, whether it's the Japanese diet, whether you, know, you look to the Mediterranean diet, they all incorporate a lot of plants. And I think looking at traditionally what have people eaten over the years, um, it's a good indication of what we should be eating. And you know, look at your own background. I think it's um, interesting when you look at what ethnicity you come from and, and find out you, you can really draw a lot of similarities. Some people can get away with you know, doing a heavier fat diet. Other people can. Some people do really well on carbs. Um, some people need to hold back on those. So you sometimes need to tweak it within this, but but there's plant food that works for all of those individuals and all those ethnicities. So what is good fuel? Um, for me, it means that it's simple, not complex. It should be just food that you can pick up in its original, whole state. It's Typically for me, it's organic. I try to eat as much organic food as possible, and I know a lot of you are probably saying, Scott, that organic food's really expensive. Trust me, I was just like you. I thought it was ridiculous to pay you know, a dollar or two more for, uh, for organic food per pound, but it's, I look at it as cheap health insurance these days. And I go to the farmer's markets, and I go to the natural uh, food stores, and I really place an emphasis on that because these are farmers that are growing it. It takes more time, and uh, it's not easy growing uh, food and plants just with um, you know, traditional methods. So um, I'd strongly encourage you to, to look at that. It also tastes a lot better, typically. It's fresher. There's more emphasis put on not just producing a product that goes on a shelf and that can last a long time. It's actually it's about taste, and it's about the nutrition that you're getting on, more vitamins and minerals. And of course, um, for me as
just somebody who's vegan, um, plants are the stronghold. Now, how to refuel. I'm going to talk a, a bit about some things, whether it comes down to food preparation or you know, selecting foods to eat. Um, you need to know how to pick the grade of fuel. Um, we have, typically in the U.S., uh, we have three options uh, when we go to the gas pump. Well, when you, you go and uh, go to the grocery store and when you're preparing your food, you have a lot of options out there and it gets confusing. So I, what I want to do is break it down and how I look at you know, picking the right fuel and how do you fuel properly. Um, fuel efficiency, I want to talk about that as well because I use the analogy of if your tire pressure is low in your tires, what happens to your, your fuel efficiency in your car? It goes down, right? A lot of you don't check your tire pressure, I know. Huh? I'm guilty as well, but it's one of the biggest things you can do. Well, the same goes with um, preparing your food. It does take time and effort, just like checking your tire pressure on your car to improve fuel. It takes time to prepare your food, but trust me, it's worth it. Um, as an athlete, I look at sometimes the time I spend in the kitchen preparing the meal is almost training because you know it's a big picture. It's not just going out and running miles. It's also looking at how can I fuel my body better so I can recover from the workouts that I do. So I think you know you need to look at that. It's also important, I think, um, from a social standpoint, culturally, um, we're all busy. Um, a lot of us don't eat meals together with our family members. Um, I don't know, maybe it's different here in the UK. I know Europeans and folks from the UK can probably spend more time together as a family eating, but it's a big issue, I think, socially and culturally. We're getting away from those traditions of sitting down. My mother used to make us sit down for an hour, regardless if we ate our meal in uh, 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, we had to sit down for an hour as a family. She's like, I spent hours cooking this meal, you're going to sit down you know, for an hour and we're going to eat together. So, I think there's some benefits to socially and culturally that we can by getting back in the kitchen, sitting down as a family and eating meals. Um, meal planning, grocery lists, um, this is a huge area. Who has a, an app that uh, basically helps you plan your meals or maybe it's a grocery list app on your smartphone? Anybody? A few of you. Okay. If you have a smartphone and you haven't checked out these apps, um, I know I'm talking technology. Grocery lists can be done easily on a piece of paper, but um, there are a lot of tools out there for your smartphones. I know a lot of you have smartphones. How many of you have smartphones? Raise your hand. Okay, well, a lot of you. So if you have one of those devices um, and you tell me, you know, going to the grocery store is confusing, I don't know what to do, get one of the grocery store apps, get one of the shopping apps, because they can help you plan your meals better. Um, when you walk into a grocery store and you just buy what, um, the worst thing you can do is go when you're hungry, but what most people do is they go down the aisles and they pick what looks good, and they realize when they get home that they didn't buy anything that they can actually make a meal with. So, actually taking some time before you go to the grocery store, you know, checking on things, planning things, you know, pick out a couple of recipes or, or dishes and meals that you like to make, and buy those ingredients and put those on the list. So, I think before you even get home and, and start cooking a meal, you have to plan it. And I like to take a look at the week sometimes and kind of figure out, okay, I'm going to have a busier night here. I'm going to have um, you know, a hard day of training on this day. I'm not going to probably spend a lot of time in the kitchen. So you can kind of start planning your week that way. And then, of course, um, the day of, you know, typically looking at the day, like in the morning, sometimes you can, you know, soak or cook beans um, in the morning that are ready for the evening. Um, anybody have a pressure cooker or a slow cooker, a crock pot? Okay. Big fan of those. It's a great way to have a meal ready when you come home, especially now when we're moving into the fall and winter, having soups, um, having curries. Uh, there are a lot of options that don't involve spending hours in the kitchen. And of course, not an instant meal like a microwave, but you know, something that's actually really good for you. So, meal planning, grocery list planning, um, all of those things are critical, and a lot of people don't uh, talk about The other thing, too, I like to do sometimes on Sundays or on the weekend is a cook-off. Who does a, a Sunday cook-off or a weekend cook-off where you prepare stuff for the week? Yeah. It's, um, it's a great way to basically make a big salad, make some beans, um, make something that you're going to use for the week. And as much as as a kid I hated leftovers, um, as an adult and probably a 
those of you who have families, leftovers are like important because I'm cooking a new meal every night. Um, we don't always have the luxury to do that. So don't be afraid of leftovers and do things such as a, a pick a day to do a cook off. I want to talk a little bit about um, natural remedies because that's kind of an important mainstay. So we're going to shift gears here. Um, I'll show you a picture. This is my ankle after the Hard Rock 100. Um, in fact, in that uh, one picture a few slides back, um, I'm going to go back there just because I think it's kind of a, a fun picture to show you guys. So during this Hard Rock 100, you notice on the right foot and the right ankle, um, that's an air cast. So I made the mistake of playing soccer uh, with a bunch of six-year-olds two days before the Hard Rock 100 back in 2007. And my ankle was the size of a grapefruit the next two days. And I'm like thinking to myself, how am I going to run this, you know, one of the most grueling 100-mile races on the planet? And what I did for that ankle was this kind of list of uh, natural remedies. I did no ibuprofen. Um, everybody asked me, well, Scott, did it hurt? Um, you bet it hurt. My ankle did hurt. But I didn't use any ibuprofen, which typically delays the healing process. Um, it's a quick fix, but it doesn't work long term. So I used everything from turmeric, which is a spice, of course, used in uh, Indian and East Asian cooking, uh, bromelain, which is a pineapple enzyme, uh, arnica montana, essential fatty acids, like omega 3s, ginger, garlic, ice, and vitamin C. And in that race, I set a new course record. Um, ideally, you wouldn't have a sprained ankle uh, to have that, but don't recommend that. But if you ever have an injury, um, instead of grabbing the ibuprofen right away, you might consider looking at the natural remedies. And those of you who have osteoarthritis, um, have uh, inflammation in other parts of the body, um, there are basically these, and I call them foods, because in most cases they're not supplements, they're foods that are extremely powerful when taken over the long term. They're not going to take away your pain like an ibuprofen or a painkiller, but what they do is they basically promote natural anti-inflammatory reaction. And uh, I think in this day and age, we're always looking for the quick fix, but these are solutions. So um, I thought it would be quite fitting that we mention uh, Hippocrates here, because even way back, you know, over a thousand years ago, in fact, almost 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates once said, let food be done medicine. And I think we could always learn something from that. Okay, so let's get into particulars, because a lot of you want to know, well, Scott, what do, you, what do you eat on a daily basis? How much fat, how much protein, how much carbohydrate do you typically include? First off, I always like to look at my diet as it's a diet of integration, not elimination. Um, so many individuals, when they start a plant-based diet or any type of diet, they, they think of, okay, well, I can't eat A, B, and C. And I think it's more important to think about, I can eat X, Y, and Z. So rather than think about the foods, if you're starting a plant-based diet or you're starting to make strides towards a veggie or vegetarian diet, um, think about the new foods that you can eat. And it's actually a lot of fun. Um, for me, when I first uh, started to learn how to become vegetarian, keep in mind, I was a meat and potatoes guy. I ate corn, carrots, and I think that was it for vegetables. Like, I literally did not eat any vegetables. I hated vegetables as a kid. Um, but I had to now learn how to prepare those. And I started incorporating new foods like quinoa, kale, all these things I had never heard of as a child or even a young adult. I started getting into it, it's a lot of fun. So embrace new foods, think about the new foods that you can integrate rather than the foods that you can't eat. The second part, when I transitioned, um, I made sure I was getting enough to eat. This is a common mistake a lot of people make. They will start off a new diet, and because they don't eat A, B, and C, they essentially you know, just eat salad or they eat you know, very low calorie. And, you know, some of you might say that's a great weight loss plan, but um, I don't recommend that. In fact, a lot of people feel low energy. Um, it's not a long-term solution. So, you know, a lot of people too tell me, Scott, I tried the whole veggie thing, I tried the vegan thing, I was always getting tired. Um, and I asked them what they were eating, and they're like, well, I would eat big salads. Um, you know, I you know, avoided things like bread, because I thought they were bad for anything. Essentially, they were just so deficient in calories that they were running out of energy. And, and if you're an athlete trying to do that, it's even worse, because now you're trying to go out and cycle and run or swim, do any other type of endurance activities, so you're running low energy. So quantity is the biggest thing to focus on. Um, if 
you're somebody who's trying to make healthy strides in your diet and in your lifestyle, focus on just getting food into your body. Um, and then you can start focusing on the quality. So don't be afraid of white bread or white sugar initially. Um, when I transitioned, I didn't try to do it all in a few weeks or even a few months. It was years of playing with things. So don't kick yourself. I know a lot of people um, also when they fall off the wagon, they like, you know, well, I tried the whole vegetarian thing, but I started eating meat or I started. Have days where you do. Like, give yourself that flexibility. Don't feel like, okay, once you slip up or once you don't maintain the diet, don't feel like you have to do that all the time. Get back on the program. So focus on the quantity, then you can focus on the quality. And by quality, I mean start doing more whole grains. Um, you know, maybe instead of the white bread, try and incorporate more grainy, um, you know, seedy type bread. And I know that's the denser bread that we don't always think about that sinks uh, you know, softly into our teeth. It's, it's the stuff you have to chew, um, including the veggies and including um, the roughage and the fiber. Um, that sometimes takes a slower transition and uh, takes a little bit of time to acquire that taste. Eventually you'll create it though. So let's, um, let's go into what my diet is when we break it down. Um, some days in training, this was uh, a goofy picture I included just to keep you awake. Because I know some of you are falling asleep. We're talking so much about food here. Um, but this was a ride I did around, um, went from Geneva down to Nice in France and rode over as many Tour de France passes over the course of eight days with my buddy from Germany. And there were days where we literally would eat a thousand calories in just one sitting, sometimes 1,500 calories we'd stop. And when I'm training super hard, I am consuming up to 5,000 calories a day. Now, keep in mind, I'm running 40 miles some of those days. Um, I'm trying to make up for calories that I've burned through. So it's not every day that I'm eating uh, 5,000 calories, nor do I recommend that to everybody. But as an ultra runner, um, one good thing about it is you get to eat a lot, and I love to eat. It's around 80 to 90 percent whole food. Um, when I travel, I will eat a little bit more processed food, but in general, I try to eat, you know, food in its original state that I've cooked up. So stuff that you can buy in the produce aisles, um, not so much in the middle aisles of the grocery store, all the box stuff. Um, I really try to limit that um, and just try to start eating things from scratch and making things from scratch. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's 90% organic, uh, unless I'm eating at a restaurant or traveling. And love to go to farmer's market too. Who goes to a farmer's market or has maybe a CSA? They, they call them CSAs here, or food shares that you can pick up. They're farmers that will deliver a box or you pick up a box. So we have those in the US become quite popular. Um, it's a way of integrating. I think there was also a vendor here that will deliver to your door every week or at this time you specify fresh organic food. It's a way to make it cheaper. It's typically a little bit more in bulk. So those are great ways. Carbohydrate. Um, I do about 50 to 60 percent of my calories are coming from carbohydrate. Now, I know there are diets and programs out there that advocate more carbohydrate. I found with as being an athlete, um, 50 to 60 percent is sufficient because I bump up the fat intake a little bit more. And my carbohydrates are usually, of course, fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, legumes. Um, I do some bread, mainly the sprouted as well as whole grain breads. Again, the breads that are chewier, sometimes a little drier. Um, but those are the ones that I find that I just kind of crave more and more now. It's not the soft white, white breads. And of course, if you're a pasta person, and a lot of runners love pasta, or it seems, we always seem to think that we need to eat a lot of pasta. I don't eat as much, but when I do, it's more whole grain or, um, or rice pasta. So um, you don't need to eat a lot of pasta as runners. In fact, I, I'm waiting for the day when they, the pasta feeds are less popular before races because I tell people, you don't need to eat pasta the night before a race. Um, you can eat any whole grain or, or rice just um, as long as it's carbohydrate rich. Okay, let's talk about fat. And I know this might surprise a lot of people, but when I'm training hard, I'm usually in that 20 to 30% fat. Now, if you're somebody who has cardiovascular disease or you've been treated for a condition and have been told to cut down your fat intake, I'm not advocating 20 to 30% for you. In fact, you should follow what your physician or your dietitian is recommending for you. But as an athlete, this is something that those of you who are running out of energy and not 
feeling as strong, you might consider bumping up your fat intake. And I don't mean, you know, eat a lot of, uh, you know, junk fat coming from processed foods. I'm talking about maybe bumping it up via some of these methods. So I get my essential fatty acids, so those such as the omega-3s, omega-6s, and omega-9s, through a product called Udo's Oil, as well as Seven Sources. Uh, I think it's in the UK here. You guys get uh, Udo's Oil? Or as I saw it, believe it or not, I saw a Salas uh, advertisement down in the tube, believe it or not. Never would see that in the US, and they're the same company that um, produces Udo's oil, and it's a blend of oil. I used to grind my flax seeds and my hemp seeds um, for you know putting it into my porridge every morning, and this kind of makes it a little bit simpler because I'm get, I know I'm getting my essential fatty acids, and they even have a blend now for those of you who are plant based that has a DHA and an EPA component. So you're going to get the full range of essential amino acids, and those are the two that a lot of people as plant-based eaters are probably not getting enough of. In fact, a lot of people who are consuming fish, uh, unless you're consuming a lot of fish, probably aren't getting enough as well. Um, I'm a big fan of olive oil and olives, um, nuts and seeds, nut butters such as almond butter, uh, coconut oil. Anybody getting into coconut oil? It's coming back. For many years, of course, we were told don't eat saturated fats. But it's interesting when you look at the Southeast and Southeast Asian populations, they don't have the incidence of heart disease. So the, the saturated fat in coconut is not to be feared as much anymore. In fact, um, you're seeing that it actually be recommended. Particularly, I use it anytime I'm going to stir fry or high heat um, foods. So if you use it for sauteing, it's much more stable. And I, I advocate that unless you use a little bit of sesame oil. Sesame oil, of course, is used in um, Asian cuisine, and I use that a little bit, but I've pretty much gone more over to uh, coconut oil. And I've stayed away from sauteing things in olive oil. So use your olive oil um, for low heat or for baking at most. Um, I wouldn't recommend sauteing it in terms of damaging the beneficial oils. Um, lastly, chia seeds. Any chia seed fans out there? We've got some folks down. Um, I, I put this one down there. I incorporate them some, but um, after Born to Run, it seemed like everybody assumed chia seed was the miracle food. It's a great superfood. Um, keep using it, but uh, it doesn't give you magical powers. It doesn't turn you into Taramara runners, um, unless somebody's had that experience, they can tell me. But it is a powerful superfood, and it's just one of the many superfoods out there. But um, it doesn't have as much energy in it that's absorbable. So those of you who are using it, use it as a supplement when you're training. Um, but don't think that the chia seeds, there's a lot of chia seed gels, look how many calories and how many grams of carbohydrates are in those because they're a little lower calorie. Um, they work and they're great, they're digestible, but um, if you need more carbohydrate calories, um, be aware of that. They, they've got about an equal amount of carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And uh, it's a real interesting food, but it's not a magic bullet. Okay, protein. This is the big issue, of course. Um, Plant-based eaters get all the time. How much protein do you get? Where do you get it? Um, and it was a big barrier for me. I mean, I was a steak and you know fish type of guy um, growing up, eating a lot of meat. And it's really just um, something you've got to get over mentally. It's a mind block that a lot of people have. And it's easy to get 15% protein from plant sources. And I can tell you, I had my doubts. You know, I remember before my first Western States 100, I was thinking to myself, there's no way I'm going to have to eat some fish or steak. I don't know if I trust myself. Just a week before the race. And you just have to get over that mind barrier. In fact, the World Health Organization advocates 7 to 8% of your total caloric intake coming from protein. So I, I put it up there in the 15 to 20% range when I'm training hard. But in general, it's not protein that most people lack in on a plant-based diet unless you just eat salads all the time. It's usually fat and overall calories. So um, protein is important. And the way that I get that in um, is tempeh and tofu. When I feel like I need a steak, and those of you who don't like tofu, you should consider tempeh. Um, it's got a nutty texture to it. It's not squishy and you know, weird tasting like tofu for some people. I, I highly recommend it. It's three grams of protein to one gram of fat. So it's a very lean source of protein and very digestible because it's fermented. So don't be afraid of the soy products that people have been eating for thousands of years. In fact, uh, Asian populations figured out a way to use the soybean in a very digestible way. Now, the hydrolyzed and the, the heavily processed isolated uh, proteins, I stay away.
away from those that are coming from soy. Um, focus more on the traditional sources, miso, um, edamame, tempeh, tofu. I think you know, cultures have been eating this for a long time. I don't think you need to be fearful. There's a lot of debate. I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but in the US. Um, it's funny, we feed our cattle soy all the time in the US. In fact, they're pretty much uh, soy creatures. And I think you know, even somebody who eats a lot of meat in the US, they're probably getting more soy than a typical plant-based vegetarian or vegan person. So, Eat them, but don't eat them. I eat them like every other day. I have a meal when I'm training hard or I'll incorporate um, tempeh or tofu, but it doesn't have to be every meal. Staples should be your beans, grains, lentils, um, any of the pulses. Again, those are traditional foods people consume on a daily basis. So when you combine a grain and a bean, it doesn't have to be in the same meal, you're getting the full array of essential amino acids. So years ago, they used to say you need to eat your grains and your beans at the same meal. Now they say just eat them throughout the day whenever, and your body's going to grab those essential amino acids and pull them out. You don't have to eat them in the same meal. When it comes to my smoothies, I do use some processed food. This is uh, the one time of the day where I eat something probably that's a little bit more processed. I use pea protein. Um, I don't know if that's becoming more popular now in Europe and in the UK, but um, brown rice and pea protein, I combine those two. I don't, there's a lot of fancy protein powders out there. Great products. Um, if you want to go a little cheaper, more economical way, I just buy the bulk bin of pea protein, bulk bin of brown rice protein. And I use some hemp protein powder. Um, again, you have to look at the labels because hemp protein powder is a great protein, but it's not as dense. So if you're somebody who wants to bump up the protein content, maybe you're a strength power um, athlete, somebody who does a lot of those activities, or you're somebody who's an endurance athlete who needs to bump it up, um, I highly recommend you know, put some rice and pea protein in with that. And then, of course, nuts and seeds to a lesser extent. Um, don't expect to, to eat a bunch of nuts and get a ton of protein. They're mostly fat. Um, they still have some protein, but it's kind of like dairy if you're somebody who's transitioning from veggie to vegan, or you're somebody who's just trying to transition to veggie. Common mistake is people eat a lot of dairy, so they just go crazy on the cheese, thinking they're getting a lot of protein. Um, you're probably better off with eggs and transitioning to something like eggs versus eating a lot of dairy because you're not going to get as much protein unless you're doing like whey protein, which is another story because that's super processed. Um, I wouldn't advocate that at all, um, but it's very common in a lot of protein powders. Okay, um, I threw this picture in. I don't know if you can see it. Probably now it's a little bit better with the light. Um, this is a top ultra runner from the U.S. His name's Eric Clifton, uh, one of my heroes, legend in the sport. Um, he's been, he prides himself on being vegetarian, I think he's been vegetarian for like 40 years. Um, quite the character, but um, this is a classic example of um, an individual who probably needs to eat supplements. If you look at his, he's got a piece of pizza, he's got a bagel with, I think, peanut butter, whipped cream, and M&M's on the top of it. Um, he's got some potato chips and some more M&M's, and maybe Skittles. Um, if you're gonna eat, and this is totally vegetarian, it's not vegan, but um, he's eating a vegetarian meal. This is post-race, so I'll give him a I'll give him a little bit of benefit that he's just you know wanting to pick out here because he's post-running 50 miles. But if you're gonna eat like this, um, vegetarian, you probably should do some supplements. Okay. Now, if you eat more whole foods, um, you know, everybody asks, you know, Scott, do you do supplements? I, I use a few and I listed them out here. But in general, I try to get my, basically the vitamins and minerals to my food. And there's a few exceptions, such as B12. Uh, that's something that I do get um, anytime that I do, say, a store-bought you know, non-dairy milk or some store-bought package, things that will have B12. Another product, um, nutritional yeast. Do you guys call it nutritional yeast here? Or is it called something else? Um, it's nicknamed hippie dust in the US. Um, it's just great stuff. If you're a fan of cheese popcorn or love your butter um, on your popcorn, you ought to try hippie dust or nutritional yeast. It's not brewer's yeast. Um, it's more gold, and it has this buttery, cheesy flavor. It's great if you put some uh, olive oil or, or throw a little uh, flax oil on your popcorn and then throw for some nutritional yeast. Great stuff. But I use that on a, I throw that on a lot of different salads and stuff, and that has B12 too. So you don't have to supplement if you're doing something regular, but um, there are times when I just put a little B12 or put a little B vitamin uh, supplement into my diet just to make sure I'm getting enough. Um, 
iron, calcium, um, zinc, those are a few I supplement as an athlete. They're, um, of course, important. Most of the time, you can get those through food, but I try to bump that up a little bit and just um, for insurance more than anything. So that's key. And then antioxidants, I learned this from Dr. Andrew Weil. Um, who's read Spontaneous Healing or any of his books, Eight Weeks Talk More Health? Probably several of you. He's the white bearded uh, doctor who graduated from Harvard, I think, in '69, and he's been a, a real promoter of integrative medicine in the U.S. He was a big inspiration when I read his books. He had this antioxidant blend of zinc, um, selenium, vitamin E, vitamin C, and vitamin A, and I've been doing that for years. This is an antioxidant blend, but. You can get those, of course, in food, and if you're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables in their whole state, you're probably going to be fine. And then I use um, probiotics, of course. Um, try to eat as many natural fermented foods. Um, do non-dairy yogurts. Um, a lot of uh, you know Asian foods, such as miso, will have um, fermented and probiotics. But if, if you don't do that, you can also do it through supplementation. Sometimes I incorporate that. Lastly, um, instead of doing a lot of vitamin pills, I do super greens. I look at these as like my vitamin in a condensed form. So things like barley grass juice, wheat grass juice, spirulina, um, seaweeds. Of course, we know the benefits of seaweeds from, of course, Japanese cuisine and Asian cuisine, and then sprouts. So those are things that when I look to like a vitamin pill, I incorporate more of these foods than try to just pop a pill in and get it in pill format. Okay, I'm down to the end here. I have a couple slides. Those of you who didn't come yesterday, I might leave a couple of them up there like during training as I answer. Can I, we have time for a few questions, I think. A few questions, and I'll leave these slides up. Um, I'll just flip through them, and you guys can jot them down. And those of you who are interested in like how you should uh, how you should train, um, you know, these are basically anything over hour and a half, two hours, and then there's a recovery slide up there too, but those of you who didn't catch those formulas, and I'll answer a few questions. We have any questions? Yes. Okay, the question is, while I'm running, do I let people know that I'm vegan and promote that? I, I don't wear it on my jersey or anything like that, but um, everybody knows that I am, and uh, what I try to do is show them on the race course by kicking their butt. Um, and it, it's one of those things where I, I show them that I, you can get results in the diet, but I, I don't you know, advertise it a lot. Um, however, I know there's a lot of folks, and, and we have a, a group in the U.S. called uh, No Meat Athletes. I know you, I see vegan runner jerseys out. I think it's great. Um, I, I promote it by just results and by showing people, hey, you can do this. You can feel great. Um, my approach has never been to cram it down anybody's throat and just promote it as, like, I feel great. I'm getting the health benefits. I'm also getting the benefits on the race course and in performance. So I think that's important, too. I think. You know, in general, if we want people to change their, their habits and become more healthy, whether it's food or exercise, um, we can't cram it down their throats. And I'm somebody who used to hate vegetables and hate running, and now I run ultra marathon or, or run ultra marathons, and I'm vegan. So I think that's what's key too is you gotta you gotta live by example, and that's what I try to do. Most importantly, good question. A couple more. Yes. So the question is, what are my, what's my secret go-to potion before races when I'm traveling? He was like, a lot of us are busy. We travel to an event. Um, we, you know, we're stuck um, eating whatever food. So I don't have a, a, a trick or a simple thing, but the, what I'd recommend is um, learn to be adaptable and be able to think. Um, I once ate at a steak joint the night before a race in Texas because the only option when I Googled vegetarian restaurants a Super America gas station convenience store came up. So if you've been to the U.S., um, essentially it literally was a gas station that came up when you typed in. So when you go to Texas, you got to be prepared. I did have some protein powder. So 
what I do is I pack a few things if I know protein is going to be an issue. You can always find baked potatoes at a steak joint. You can always find vegetables on the side. So I got creative with that and then just didn't worry about the protein. So the night before, even though a lot of people think that's the most important meal that you eat, much like sleep or anything else, that what you do the night before is important, but um, what you eat the whole week during the week before the race is probably much, much more important. So learn to be adaptable, plan ahead. Um, protein's probably gonna be your biggest issue. Um, so pack something from a protein standpoint. Um, fats and carbohydrates probably aren't. Although here I imagine there's a lot of dairy and things, so you might wanna bring your own fat source. So you just, you just learn how to plan ahead a little bit. But I, I love to eat, you probably should eat ethnic um, and learn to eat ethnic the night before a race and training. Um, so practice that um, and see if you can eat Mexican or um, beans and rice and grains before. Because I, when I'm traveling, I sometimes now don't pack a lot of you know, my own foods. I used to pack a cooler of stuff. I try to eat, I call it modern hunting and gathering. Try to eat at the airports, try to eat on the plane and figure out, okay, what can I eat? Because a lot of you aren't probably gonna pack a cooler. I found that out over the years. So I wanna I experiment a little bit and see, if, can I do this if I'm, some, I'm somebody who's not gonna pack a lot of stuff and really put a lot of effort. But um, do a little research too beforehand. You know, Find out what grocery stores, what restaurants are available. I think that's really key. It's a good question. A lot of people have that issue. And then one more. Okay, what liquid mixes do I use when I'm racing? I'm sorry, I, I forgot to advance the slide here. You're looking at Dusty <laughs> for so long. I'll forward these. Um, the mixes I use in terms of sports foods for races, um, I use Cliff products and it looks, I, I just noticed at some of the sports stores and stuff, in fact at the half marathon today at some of the booths, um, Cliff products are available in the UK now and they're starting to become more prevalent in Europe. But they use, most of their products have 90% organic ingredients. So they're a sport food that's really focused on high quality. Now they still have you know, sugar in them, of course, but your body burns to that. So I use their, their Cliff Shot, their Cliff, um, Cliff Shot electrolyte drink, um, the gel blocks. Do you guys, have you seen those? They're basically gummy, I guess you could say, um, gels in a, a gumdrop format. And I use a lot of those um, racing and becoming more popular. So I use that along with real foods such as bananas, potatoes, bean and rice burritos. And I, I put a couple of slides up here too as far as how much carbohydrate you should eat when you're exercising. And this goes whether you're eating um, bars, gels, or you're eating bananas or potatoes. So you can figure out how many grams of carbohydrate and that's per hour. So there's a high and a low. And then I incorporate whether I'm eating the real food or the sport foods. So you just have to play around with. And, and if you're somebody who's like, well, I'm not going to, you know, you know, take, I'm not going to care really what sport foods you use. What you eat during the race um, isn't probably going to be a big issue unless you're eating gels all the time every day. Um, all of these foods are probably not the best. They're still processed. You know, even if it's a cliff shot that's 90% organic, um, you're still talking a processed food. But, you know, you're eating that, you know, for you know, several hours, or in the case of an ultra marathon, for 24 hours, and then you're going back to real food. So I try to, you know, not overdo it on the sports foods on a daily basis. I just use the bars um, when it comes to, like, recovery stuff and just keep the electrolyte drinks to more, like, long days or, or races and drink that. And then I'll, I'll put up another one here for recovery, so everybody get, get an, a gist of that. And this is how you, have, of course, you know, you read the label by finding how many carbohydrates are in the label. And then I'll go to this one here, because this is an important one. For recovery, some of you had questions on recovery. Here's a slide that gives you how many grams of carbohydrate, how much protein you should eat recovery-wise. Um, and I can leave some of these up and flip through them um, as uh, we're finishing up. But uh, that's what I've got to talk to you today about. I want to thank you all for coming out. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. I've got another day in the UK tomorrow, and then I'm back home. And hope to get back and get to some other areas. I know I'm getting a lot of flack that I only came to London. In fact, a lot of people are really bummed in, uh, from Bristol to Yorkshire to Lancaster to Edinburgh. They're all you know, really uh, ticked off at me. So hopefully they'll have me if I come back and make my rounds. But um, thanks again. I do. There's a few books upstairs I think they have. If you go to the Vegetarian Guide um, booth, which is upstairs. Um, I'll sign, those of you who do have some books that want me to sign, I'll stick around here, right? I don't know, if, where's my person? Is this room okay to, to sign in or should I move? Okay, I'll sign books up front. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming out today and thanks for having me.